We are going to be moving permanently to one service. Okay, so you're, you're used to doing that over the summer, um, but we are going to start and then we're gonna do it permanently. The time is going to be a little bit different. Um, instead of the 10 o'clock, which we normally do, the service is going to be at 9.30 um, with Sunday School to follow that at 10.45. Okay, you don't, you don't have to memorize that now. We're gonna communicate that um, this is pretty much just the first time we're rolling this out right now. Um, one of the main reasons we're doing that is because we've done, we've looked at the statistics over the last couple years and we are well below 50% capacity. Look around right now. We are well below 50% capacity at every service um, with the exception of Easter, things like that. Um, so what we, we've done a lot of research, a lot of homework. We've talked to a lot of you in the audience out here. Um, what we found is when you get below 50%, people start to get uncomfortable. The congregates get uncomfortable. There's a lack of feeling of energy. You kind of lose that sense of community that comes with the full church. And the other reason is visitors feel uncomfortable. They're kind of like, feel like they're put on the spot. They're, they're wondering where everybody is. They're, they don't sense the energy of the church. So a lot of studies, a lot of research been done over many, many, many years. When you get below 50% capacity on average, it's time to, to change what you're doing. So we're gonna move to one service for that. Um, the other reason is, I don't know if you know, but to conduct two services every Sunday, it requires 29 volunteers, not staff paid members, just the volunteers, 29. So if we move to one service, it requires 17 volunteers. And unfortunately, we are really struggling to get volunteers to do things. Um, you can ask anybody whose job it is to recruit people. It's a tough, tough job. So we are moving to one service. Um, this was approved by the church council on during the March 13th meeting. Um, this is being kind of led um, by the lay leader team. Um, so if you have any questions, concerns, issues, um, you can speak to you can speak to me. You can speak to Victor Verzetti, Doris Morris, or Fran Smart. Um, they all will be able to address any questions or concerns that you might have. All right, thanks. And now in the quietness and confidence that is our strength in God, let us prepare ourselves for this worship service. As you're able, we invite you to stand for our call to worship. Praise the Lord. Let everything that breathes praise the Lord. Praise the Lord with the sounds of the trumpet, with tambourine and the dance. Let everything that breathes praise the Lord. Our hymn is number 304 in your hymnal. Easter people, raise your voices.
And now in union, let us join together in our prayer of praise and adoration. You are Alpha and Omega, O God, the beginning and the end of creation. You cause the formless void to burst into splendor, filling space and revealing your goodness. Your only begotten, Jesus Christ, came to bring peace and reconcile those who are estranged. We who have been made one gather to praise your goodness and raise our voices in glad adoration. Amen. Our gospel lesson this morning is from John chapter 20, beginning with the 19th verse. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. John, Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. This reading is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. And you may finally be seated. Good morning. Can I have the younger people in the audience please come up? Hi, everybody. Spider-Man gloves, awesome. Hi. You lost your shoe. There you go. Hi, everybody. Well, last Sunday was a big deal, right? What was last Sunday? Easter. Easter, that's right. Did everybody get a visit from the Easter Bunny? Bring candy? Yeah. Did you guys get presents? Yeah. A few presents? Just, or just candy? Did you get a present too? A stuffed animal was an awesome present. That's great. And it talks. Excellent present. Well, if you uh, were listening to the passage that was just read, and it's okay if you weren't, you're probably doing other important things. We're talking today about something else that happened on Easter, which is that Jesus came back from the dead, right? And this week we're talking about how he came and he showed himself to the disciples. But Thomas, who was one of the disciples, wasn't there. He missed it. Imagine how disappointed he was. And he came back, and all the disciples said, Look, we saw Jesus. He was here. He's alive. He didn't die. And Thomas was like, Sure, I'm not going to believe that. Because he hadn't seen it, right? What's well, a pretty incredible thing to claim. So sometimes it's okay to doubt if you haven't seen something. Now, there's a box there behind you guys. Come on, take a look. You're wondering about that box? 
Are you supposed to open it? No. I'm going to tell you what we're going to do. What do you think's in there? And we're not going to start guessing because that would take all day. It could be anything, exactly. <laughs> Too small for a snowblower. Yes, it is. Um, what if there was a puppy in that box? Well, how could you tell if there was a puppy in the box? Exactly, Jonah. It's not moving. And there's no air. And well, yeah, and it's no sound. Like the puppy would bark, right? That's right. So it can't be a puppy. I'm telling you, it's not a puppy. What if it was cupcakes, chocolate cupcakes? How could you tell without opening it that it was cupcakes? You could. You could shake it. You could shake it, or a better way. You'd smell them, exactly. You could sniff the box, and it would smell like chocolate, right? It wouldn't move, that's right, because they wouldn't be alive, right? But you could sniff it. What if it was a box full of bells? How could you tell without opening it? Shake it. Yeah, that's right, it would jingle, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, what if there was an angel in the box? Doubting Thomas. Who thinks that there could be an angel in the box? Could be. Yes? Some of you are doubting. Okay. Tell you what, Jonah. And you too, come with me. The rest of you stay here. Jonah, come, come on up, Jonah. Everybody else stay there. Come on this side. If she wants to come too. She's all right. She can come too. I don't want to make it. No, no. Everybody else stay where you are. Just Jonah. <laughs> Just Jonah. All right. Come and take a look. Okay, close it up. All right, those who saw, what's in the box? Tell them. Go tell them. Now, now, what did it look like? You can tell them what it looks like. It has wings. Uh huh. A yellow dress on, right? And wing. And a cross necklace. Uh, 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 uh. And brown skin. Yes. Okay. Now, do you believe? She's a plant, isn't it? No, 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 no. We're not going to look yet. You guys can't say. You guys can't say. These guys have to convince you. Are you convinced? No. Well, yeah, okay, not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Not. Not. So, in a lot of ways, you guys are like the disciples, right? You're all climbing up on stage. You guys are like the disciples because somebody sat back and said, I saw Jesus. And these guys are saying, look, there's an angel in the box. Don't you want to see? Yes. Well, the one thing that Jesus said is blessed are those who have not seen, like you guys, you have not seen, and yet still believe. Okay. That's the Bible part. And for those who really want to know if there's an angel in the box, yes. There's, a, there's an angel in the box. You didn't believe that. It's an angel. Look, it's an angel. It's a toy angel. So thank you for coming up, and thank you for being such good sports today, all right? Well, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree, does it? I'm sure by now you've seen the bulletin layout, the order of the service, and you see the message is entitled, Against All Odds. And just below is the announcement of the hymn following the message, He Lives. So there's the message. That's enough, isn't it? Let's move on. 
against all odds, he lives. Uh, these bulletin um, oddities, if I can use that word, are often a source of great humor. I see them published every now and again, uh, church bloopers and things like that. I'm sure you all have too. Uh, they're always published on email and or on uh, faith email and uh, are quite humorous. But this one reminds me of a of a story I heard about a, a preacher in a rather large church who published his bulletin in this form, but he had two services, one in the morning and one in the evening. Some of you remember that pattern from your earlier days in church. And um, on the left side of the bulletin, in, he would print or he would have printed the order of service for the morning service and then on the right side in smaller form because it was a it was a less well attended service there would be an order of service for the evening and that was the way the bulletin was produced every week once in leaving he said to the secretary in the office look i'm going out of town i have to go in a hurry uh, i do not have a sermon topic for the Sunday morning service. So I'd like for you just to put where it says message, sermon by the pastor. And then I'll figure out what the title is when I get back. And he said on the evening service, I'm going to preach on the psalm that goes or reads, the fool has said in his heart there is no God. But he said, I don't have a topic for that either, and I'm just going to let you design it. You come up with a topic for that. And that will be the way we'll leave the bulletin. So it was agreed. He left. He came back Sunday morning. And in preparation for the service, sat down at his desk and opened the bulletin. And yes, on the left there was message, sermon by the pastor. Then he looks over to the right side to the order for the evening service. Message, what the fool said. <laughs> well, a little humor to sort of highlight something that's always in tension. We, T-E-N-S-I-O-N, something always in tension, and we saw it so beautifully demonstrated uh, with the junior sermon. And that is the message given the church that on Easter, Jesus rose from the dead. Against all odds, he rose from the dead and created a new expression of God's will and God's work in the world and invited all people to participate in it. And first revealed that stupendous miracle by showing himself to his disciples. And Twelve of them had been chosen. One of them had betrayed him. There were 11 left. And 10 of them believed, but one of them wasn't there. So the question in the text was, what are the odds that the revelation of the Christ, the risen Christ, accepted by the 10 disciples, would also be believed by the one? And we know the story there that was read this morning. Uh, no, uh, Thomas found himself not quite sure about what that message meant. He wasn't ready to sign on. He wasn't ready to say, I can understand what you're saying because it's you who are saying it to his brothers and sisters in Christ, And unless I actually see what you have seen, unless I experience that for myself, I will not believe. Don't read the Bible to me. Don't tell me what the church says. Don't tell me what my grandfather said. Don't tell me what other people said. I must experience that myself or I will not believe. Is that a bad thing to say?
Well, we've kind of made Thomas out to be a sort of a, not a nice person. He's even got a pejorative nickname. It's called Doubting Thomas. And all he was doing was saying, you tell me that you've seen something I haven't seen and you want me to believe it because you say you've seen it. I must tell you that I'll not surrender my reality to you and to your witness. I want to see it for myself. I don't think that tension has existed in the Christian church since that time. Against all odds, Jesus rose from the dead. But we find odds within ourselves when we are asked to sign on to it and say, yes, that's my testimony too. Um, I was visiting recently with, uh, some of us have no difficulty, by the way, with the proclamation of the church. We accept it. It's what has been believed across the years and we accept it as, um, as worthy of the church's belief and we sign on to it and don't raise too many questions about it. Uh, one of our older members passed away recently. His name was uh, Horace Sherrill. Many of you remember Horace. He and Mary Lou started a ministry in this church years ago that uh, made communion available to shut-in people, called it the Caritas Ministry. And they had a little prayer. They put in the, uh, the little uh, communion uh, containers and would go out after the communion was dedicated here at the altar and share it with the shut-ins. And I used to take this, this um, sacrament to Horace and Mary Lou and would read that prayer. Horace had read it many times himself. One line of which said, uh, Jesus by his suffering and death took upon himself our, in Jesus' suffering and death, addressing God in the great thanksgiving, you took upon yourself our sin and death and destroyed their power forever. Our sin and death and destroyed their power forever. So one day we were having communion. I said, let's stop on that and let me just ask you, what do you think that means? And Horace said just exactly what it says. <laughs> and that was the end of the discussion. <laughs> Didn't have to go any further. It was the prayer of the church. It was the prayer that had been given the church. It was a prayer through which his own faith was expressed. And that was enough. But recently I was talking to one of our members who, who is um, experiencing the difficulties of life, has a lot of questions that can't be answered easily, and said to me in the course of the conversation, I can't pray. I don't know what to say. I don't know how to bring what I'm feeling to words and address it to God. Walter Brueggemann said in his study on the Psalms that in biblical piety, especially in Hebrew piety, everything that one experiences must be brought to words and it must be addressed to God. There's nothing within the realm of human experience that has to be kept secret. You don't have to bear it yourself. You can say it. You remember Fiddler on the Roof, don't you? I had the great privilege of going to Broadway to see um, Zero Mostel in that play when it was first put on Broadway. And he was a great Tevye. I always loved that part of the play where he was walking down stage arguing with God. <laughs> actually shaking his fist at heaven. And I said, oh, wow, Jews can get away with that, but Methodists can't possibly do that. It's forbidden. No negative expressions. 
And Tevye was talking to God about the conditions of the little village that he was kind of a prominent leader in. And he finally ends his soliloquy or his complaint by saying, I know that we are the chosen people, but why don't you choose someone else every now and then? Yeah, I can't pray. I don't know what to say. The others of you are singing, he lives. Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. I'm not so sure about that. Uh Uh-uh. Things are tough for me right now. I'm not making this up. This This is the heart cry. So what are the odds that that lament can move to praise as an expression of life? That fascinates me, and I'm always wondering as a pastor how that happens. Some people want me to make it happen. I don't know how. I know what happened to Thomas, though. He stayed with the church. He sat on the back pew. Sorry, folks. That's all right. You're okay back there. Come on up if you want to. But Thomas didn't get any closer to the front than that. And he said, y'all can go ahead and sing your songs if you want to and just have a big time. But not me. I'm not with you on this. And the marvelous thing about that story is that Thomas stayed with the church and the church stayed with Thomas. They didn't run him out. The church is not a cult. You don't have to believe exactly alike. The rhythms of your spiritual life don't have to be identical. You can be different. You can be different. I can be different. We can still be one in Christ. And that was the beauty of that story about Thomas. And finally, in one of its meetings, after he had asserted himself, now get this important, after he had said no to the witness of the disciples, he didn't say no to Christ. He didn't say, I don't believe in Jesus. I don't believe in Christ. He said, I'm talking about your witness to Christ. I can't accept it. Your word's not enough. I must experience it myself. I think that's very legitimate. Yeah, I think we can ask for that. And then we see the end of the story where in that week later, Jesus appears again and Thomas was with them, still doubting. Still struggling, still saying, I can't pray. I don't know how. I don't know what to say. And Jesus said, Thomas, reach out your hand here and touch my hands and touch my side and see that I am with you, that I am your Lord. And I am your God. And even though the odds are against it, I have been raised over the power of death. And in me, you can find new life yourself. Wow. And then Thomas, not because the disciples said it, but because Jesus came and showed himself, found a way to experience this marvelous grace. I went to the hospital one day um, to see Mabel. She was a great lady. She was very ill. And I walked into her room, stood by her bed, and she said, hello, Pastor. I've just seen Jesus. 
Now, I put on my Thomas hat right there because I, I know she was looking at me, and I ain't Jesus. That I know, too. I just seen Jesus. Jesus was just here in my room. And I said, well, Mabel, I'm so glad to hear that. Uh, that means I have one less pastoral visit to make because if the boss has already been here, there's nothing more that I can say. And we had a wonderful talk, and she told me what she had seen and experienced. And you know, when you go in this hospital, you have to sign, you had to sign your name, even the pastors did, the time you entered and the time you left. And I went down and looked at the roster and uh, Jesus' name wasn't on there. He didn't stop by the administrator's office and introduce himself. He didn't say anything to the nursing station. He just walked in and stood at Maple's bed. And the two of them engaged in the kind of talk that only people can engage in when they're in the presence of the living God. He works that way, doesn't he? That's what he did with Thomas. Just showed up. So the meaning of the text is this. Against all odds, he lives. Stay with your doubts. Stay in yourself. But stay with reality. Tell God who you are and what you are and what you need. And be honest about it. And be frequent about it. And don't be surprised if someday while you're sitting in your room with all your doubts, he just shows up and says, it is I. Don't be disbelieving, but believe. If I've got time for one more quotation, I always loved the, one of the paragraphs in Albert Schweitzer's The Quest of the Historical Jesus in which he addressed this tension between what the church knows and how each of us discovers it. He said it this way. He comes to us, speaking of Jesus, as one unknown, without a name. As of old by the lakeside, he came to those men who knew him not. He speaks to us the same word, follow me, and sets us to the tasks he has for our time. He commands, and to those who obey, he will reveal himself in the toils and the sufferings and the conflicts they will experience in his fellowship. And as an ineffable mystery, each shall learn in their own experience who he is. Against all odds, he lives. Stay in the game. It's a safe bet. Thanks be to God. Amen.
may be seated. My goodness, every time we came to the next verse, you, you just came, came more. And, and isn't that what we've learned today? That even though sometimes we may start slow, and sometimes the conflicts and the doubts and the questions just swirl around us. And when life situations don't make sense and it shouldn't be as it is, we still come to believe. And that's what happens here. So I thank God for that. And I thank God for you and the, your faithfulness in coming to believe today. And that's why within our worship we have this opportunity to give because there is that small portion of us which matches that which we give which comes then so that others too may come to believe. And that's to be given thanks for as well. Will the ushers please come forward? away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, brought us to a land flowing with milk and honey, and set before us the way of life. 
And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. <laughs> Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Please be seated. Holy are you and blessed is your Son Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. Once we were no people, but now we are your people, declaring your wonderful deeds in Christ, who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, Jesus took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us, as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ is died, Christ is risen. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Now as the forgiven and reconciled people of God, let us pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The body of Christ broken for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. I invite those of you who are sharing with us in the distribution of the communion elements to come forward. Communion at the table of the Methodist Church is an open communion available to all who confess that Jesus Christ is their Lord and Savior. We have gluten-free elements available to those of you who require it, and these will be served at the front of the chancel by the pulpit.
prayers and anointing for healing will be offered at the altar following your receiving the sacraments if you require that, if you want to have that, Reverend Hastings will see that you are served in this way. Let the ushers come forward now and direct our folk to the table.
couple of page 11. Let us pray together. Eternal God, we thank you for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. This service has ended, but your life in Christ goes on. Go now into the world to serve in Christ's name. Be kind, be strong, love one another, live in peace, and the peace of God be with you now and always. Amen.